And at this time, I'd like to present to you your friend and my friend, Norm A. from Monrovia, California. Norm? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for those very kind words. Good evening, folks. My name is Norm. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm certainly delighted to be here tonight and be part of this Texas State Convention. I want to thank Cersei and the committee for the invitation, the opportunity to be down here and to participate. I certainly want to thank all of the people, and I mean all of the people that are here that have made us welcome and have showed us around since we've been here. Also, I'd like to welcome any and all new people that may be here tonight for your first, second, or third meeting or first couple of weeks at Alcoholics Anonymous. We're sure glad to have you. I'm sure that you're uh, aware of the fact that you've now associated yourself with one of the most popular, unpopular fellowships in the world, you know. Nobody starts out his life wanting to become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't think, but I can say this without any reservations whatsoever, that if you've got a drinking problem, you never have to take another drink again if you don't want to. What you're going to find here in AA is a group of people who are going to know most everything about you, you will still accept you, who are not necessarily interested in where you've been or where you tried to go, but were damned interested in what you're trying to do today. And that within itself has got to be a break. You know, when I was out there drinking, nobody was interested in what I was doing that day. Unless they heard I was going to jail or leaving town. And then, man, they're delighted over that. Other than that, you know, they don't care one way or another. And all they want to know is, you know, get him out of sight. Get him out of the bed. Get him in jail. Get him out of town. Get him out. But if you're a new person here and you want what we have, this, you see, it will change. If you want to stop drinking, all you've got to do is pick up the telephone and make a call. And people are going to come down there to see you. And they're going to sit there not with that pity and that hate you've been used to, but they're going to sit there with compassion and understanding. That's got to be the best deal that I ever had in my life, and I'm a guy that looks half the world trying to find the best deal. And I didn't find it till I got here, till I found this group of people who will know most everything about me will still accept me. To qualify the initial statement that I made, I, for the benefit of the new people that are here, I'm an alcoholic. And I'm not by any stretch of the imagination an authority, a consultant, or a counselor on the program Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm an example, good or bad, that AA works, that it hasn't been necessary for me to take a drink, steal anything, or go to jail now for 19 years and four months. I, I don't reckon it. I don't believe anybody out there tonight really is over, overly impressed with that statement, you see, but I'll tell you something, man, I'm impressed with that statement, you know. And you never know, hell, we may get a pension program going here, and if we ever do, you know. I'd like to get credit for all my time, so you got to bring that out. But uh, nevertheless, I am delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to be able to stand here and to talk to the new people as to why or why not we're alcoholic. We could talk about this for a long time, and each individual has a reason as to why he is alcoholic. And I, you know, as a matter of fact, mentioning the fact that I've been around here for 19 years plus, why I believe that to the new people you find that difficult to digest. If I'd have told you, you know, I'd have been around AA for a couple of months, I'm sure you'd have come up to me after the meeting and said, the hell you have, man, how'd you do that? You know, you can understand a couple of months, but it's damn difficult to understand them years, and I can sympathize with it because I remember sitting there in that first AA meeting, and it was just like yesterday that I can remember sitting there in that first group, and I'm 29 years old, and I wondered why it is. My God, why am I an alcoholic of all the things I could have been? Why am I an alcoholic? And this guy stands up in front of the group and he says, I ain't had a drink in nine and a half years. And I thought, he's got to be the biggest liar I've ever heard. You know, my God, how could anybody be out there in that rotten jungle in nine and a half years meeting his responsibility and being honest and dealing with all them nasty people? And he's been doing it now for nine and a half years and he's doing it sober and I found it difficult to digest or to understand. And I didn't hear him say, I'm sure, but I'm sure he said it. He said, I've been making it one day at a time. So for the benefit of the new people that are here tonight, I've been cutting it out there one day at a time. I learned a while ago that if you take care of the day, the week will take care of itself and will the year and will the month and so on. Before you know it, by 19 years have run by, and it is, not to repeat myself, but it was, just like yesterday that I sat at that meeting and wondered why it was that I was alcoholic. I come from a family of heavy drinkers. Hell, everybody in my family drinks. And we're Irish and Italian. That means, number one, you're not overly intelligent, but it means you know a little bit about that booze, you know. We know we know how to make booze and drink booze, and my people are still making it and drinking it, I turned out to be the only alcoholic. And I sat there wondering why it is that I've been selected to carry the cross of the rotten family when I'm the best in the family. There wasn't any question about that, you see. And all of these things, you know, are running through your mind. As though you read a little literature, you read the book, and you talk to a few guys about this problem as to why or why not you're alcoholic. And I come to find out after going through this, a big giant decision. I'm alcoholic because I, I drank too much whiskey. That's the reason I'm alcoholic. You see, my case is really not that complicated. I had a few other things going for me. I'm a rationalizer, a justifier, a compromiser, and I got a rotten attitude. And man, you don't need much more than that. You see? I've had a 
lousy outlook on living as far back as I can remember. I traveled half the world in half my life. I made a complete ass of myself out there. I spent money I didn't have by things I didn't need trying to impress people I didn't like. And that's the story of my life. I never sit down, you see. Because I was I run all over hell trying to be all things to all people. I never knew what I wanted to be. I thought out there for years I was a general manager of the universe. My God, what a hell of a responsibility that is. No wonder I drank so much. I got all them things to manage out there. I got all them castles to build and all them corporations to form. And it's kind of a letdown, isn't it? When you walk into AA and you find out you're no longer the general manager, you're only a drunk, you know. Well, it's, it's all right. It works both ways. It's kind of a gratifying experience to find out that uh, you're only a drunk and this is what you are. And by so doing, you're able to grab and buy the package of AA. And when you do, you come to find out that all you ever wanted to be in your whole life, Norm, is be able to spend a day or find a way that you can spend a day out there to be in yourself. And that's what the program has brought me. It's brought me sobriety and many other things. But above all, it's shown me a way where, a way where I can spend a day. And all I've got to be is me. And I can take that and I can take it out on the city street. And I can spend a day on the city street where I don't have to compromise my life nor justify my existence. I can... Spend a day there just be a be, and it's a hell of a deal. It's one of the finest things I've found, and I think that no alcoholic should be without it. You know, when you come to the program, as you said, they sent you straight right away. When you walk in through the doors, what they say, man, don't impress us here in AA, buddy. We have been impressed by experts in Alcoholics Anonymous. Just come on in and be yourself. That's all you got to be. But if you got an attitude like I have and a personality with somewhere down the road, well, you got to lay a little on a guy. And one night, I thought I'd put a little on this guy, you know, and I mentioned to him, I said, man, you know I've been in jail about 25 times. And he said, the hell you have, I did that in a year. You know, so, <laughs> that is my dear friend said, no matter where you've been, somebody got there long before you did. And no matter what booze or how much you drank, you're going to run across people that drank more than you thought was Bill. So if you're new, come on in and grab the packages here. Take it out on that city street tomorrow and spend the day being yourself. And it's a hell of experience, as I say. No alcoholic should be without. If I may, this evening, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I was like, what happened, and what I'm trying to be like today. Not that I'm going to impress you with the amount of booze I consume, but when a man comes to me and he says, Norm, how does AA work? Well, AA works because of, number one, because of the AA book. That's the way it works, the Alcoholics Anonymous book. And they didn't mishmash around with it when I come in. I don't mean to sound like an old timer or anything like that. But when I come in, they didn't say, well, you better buy a book. They said, man, you better spend three fifty and buy a book, and if you don't buy a book, you're going to get drunk. That's the way it is. Now, you went and bought the damn book. Because if you wanted to stay sober, that's the way it was. Well, the books in those days were calculated risk. Hell, they had that cover. You know, it was red, yellow, and black. You could see it for two blocks, so when you bought it, you put it on your coat, you went out. <laughs> and if this is the paradox of the alcoholic, he, he don't want anybody to know he's trying to do something about his life. You know, no, I know that. <laughs> it's fine if they see you laying drunk in the middle of the street. That's fine. You know, no problem there. But good God, you know, don't let them think that you're going to do something about that. No. So you buy the answer, and you buy the book, and you hide it, and you run to your car. There you go. You see, you well, uh, number one, this is the way that the program works to the new people who through the AA book. No question. Secondly, it's because it's one drunk talking to another drunk between the two of you stay sober. What a couple of drunks talk about when they get out there. They talk about all the hack and the hustle they had out there in the street. They talk about coming to the program and find a better way to operate. They talk about some things that they use to stay sober over a period of time. And so tonight, if I may, I'd like to tell a little bit about a few things that have happened to me past, present, future, or future we hope, and today in specific. Uh, my life, as you can readily understand, I had a lot of problems. I'm a guy out there trying to impress the human race about all of these things. I got an attitude problem. I could sum it up by saying, I'd be the guy you'd find out here today. You know, it's 100 and you got 90 degree humidity, and I'm driving around town with all the windows rolled up in my car because I want everybody to believe I got an air conditioner. You see? <laughs> the story of my life, I've always got to impress them with that sense of well being out there. Well, you know me, today when I'm riding around town in LA and I see these guys with the windows rolled up in their car, you know what I think? Does he or doesn't he? You know, yeah. <laughs> so with this kind of attitude, you know, you can understand I'm a guy who's going to have a lot of trouble out there, and I did. I started going to jail in the late 30s, not for drinking in the beginning, but for stealing in the beginning. I happen to be a thief by trade. I'm an alcoholic by absorption. I opened up the midnight auto supply out there in the San Gabriel Valley. And what that consisted of at the beginning, we started out popping hubcaps, just kind of as a fun thing, and we learned you could make a little money at it. So we branched the program out, and we went from hubcaps to car accessories, and then it got to be such a job to gather up all that crap, we stole the whole car, you know. And then the thing went from there on out. I was considered one of the finest car thieves that ever came out of the San Gabriel Valley. 
And that was a pretty good deal in the late 30s. You know, you had to move to get ranked up there in the top ten. We had some fair hookers out there, you know. You had to really move. So, I'm a guy with a large ego, and i got to have it satisfied, and this was a satisfaction. I could go on and talk about this all day. You wouldn't understand it, you know. If you've never laid on the floorboards of a man's car and you're getting his radio out, for example, and your buddy's out there on the street just got known the guy's coming out the door. you got about three minutes. You get that instantaneous exhilaration. God, you just kind of shake all over, and the sweat runs, and you die, and you live. And that was me. The synthetic existence out there, the fantasy land. Hell, Disney's late. I've lived in that fantasy land all my life. You know, I'm the dreamer out there, and I was dreaming, and that was part of me and part of life. Eventually, I was arrested. I stood in front of a judge. I was told by the judge I was going to the Whittier Reformatory for the following seven years. Through the efforts of some people and some circumstances and breaks or whatever you want to call it, being born and raised in L.A., being Irish and Italian, I'm sure it has something to do with it. Something got worked out, and before you know it, I'm back on the street. And the time is I'm put on probation in this community. Well, alcohol hasn't come into my life yet, but the attitude has. I got the attitude. I'm standing out there reacting to life and to living. I never bought living on living's terms. I want that day. You know, I want it my way, and that's the way it's going to be, and I'll bend and twist and turn it until it's going to be that way. Well, this, everything is set. Now, booze is the next step. Alcohol came into my life on Easter week, 1940. And Easter week in L.A. is a big time. Easter week, 1940, Balboa Beach, the Rendezvous Ballroom, Stan Kenton, and Padre Beer. And it was a hell of a deal right from the start. We drink that booze, that beer, and you get a little buzzy, and you went into the dance, and you had a pretty good time. And you acted four times drunker than what you were, and I liked it. I liked the effect and the feeling. I'm not alcoholic from the beginning. A lot of people feel they were alcoholics from the initial, I'm sure. In your particular case, this is true. This is fact. But I'm not looking for the answer to living in the corner of whiskey yet. One's too many and a thousand are enough. No, no. So I don't continue on from then and want to drink each and every day. I kind of worked at it. I moved out of that Padre beer down to that Rainier Ale, that old green death. And from there I went on out to that Ten High Whiskey. And when I got to that Ten High Whiskey, I found the greatest thing made since money and girls. Because that whiskey gets you there quicker. And I've been in a hurry all my life. <laughs> I don't... I don't want to be there in a little while. I want to get there now. And getting there is there. That's the plateau. The alcoholic drinks yourself up to, isn't it? But, you know, the more you drink, the better you feel. And the better you feel, the better the buzz you got on. And pretty soon, the more you drink and you're just, you reach the ultimate, the plateau, and you're buzzy all over, you know. God, you sit there with that total buzz on thinking, man, if I could hold that forever. And I'd order one more just to stay even. Down the chute you go, you know. <laughs> When man there for a while, you know, you got that buzz on and you're all things to all people. You're good looking, well built, intellectual and wealthy, and you got the job done in two hours with that whiskey. That's the best deal I ever had. A friend of mine out there on the coast, he explains it very well. He's up north now, but he tells it he said there's a period of time in there when you're buzzy and you feel the good and if you're gonna do anything, you better do it then, because that's all the time you got. Yeah. <laughs> An hour and a half before that, you're too sick, and after it, you're too drunk, man. So you better get her down there. <laughs> it's sure the truth. You sit there with that buzz on and shit. Ah, you're all things to all people. And that's what the whiskey did. That old 10 high, it was a little rough going down. You had to train harder, I think, on 10 high than some of that other stuff. Uh, don't get me wrong. I've drank good whiskey in my day, but I, frankly, after four or five drinks, how could you tell the difference? Good whiskey, cheap whiskey, bad, didn't make any difference. As long as it was whiskey, that was the only important thing. Well, the whiskey was important, the ten high economically, hell, you never met a better buy in your life. I think that juice has gone up for about six or five cents a pint in them days. You know, that's how are you going to go wrong? And you felt every loving drop going down, that ten high, baby. That's just got it tore, going and it's tearing, coming up again. You remember? Hey, you remember how it'll run out your nose and it makes your eyes water. Yeah. And then one of your friends goes, ain't that good? Yeah, what's that? It's good. <laughs> it's the good you can't breathe. It's the good, you know. Yeah. You get one off, you know, under the front seat. He's about 105 and tilt it back. God. The good old days. <laughs> Well, that was the beginning in the, of maybe the problems. Maybe, maybe I'm starting to move over this invisible line they talk about in AA into the compulsive area of my drink. I don't know. I do know that I got to jam this all. The whiskey drinking started up in the state of Oregon. The reason I was there, a little trouble in L.A. And I had to, I was, I had to leave before I got picked up and went back to jail. And then I got in trouble when I was up there in the state of Oregon. I was dabbling again in the car business. And the folks said, you'd go to jail or get the hell out of the city. So I left. Uh, years ago, there was a man in my part of town that he told my life story. He stood up there in front of the group and he said, if it was too big to carry, I laid down beside it and claimed it. And then, <laughs> the story of my life. 
the story of my life. So I came back to Los Angeles in January of 1942. I enlisted in the United States Navy. Not because I was over patriotic, but I had the heat on. I had to get the heat off. I got the heat out of two states that the probation department gave me a deal. They said, go to jail and go to the service. So I went to service. You know, there's not much of a deal there. Now we've selected the United States Navy. I find that this was another one of my bad decisions. Uh, I went into the United States Navy, and all the enemies I had in L.A. joined the Navy the same day I did. You know, they're, they're waiting for me. They started giving me a, a lot of problems, a lot of trouble, telling me things I was going to have to do and what I couldn't do. And I started to have more trouble. In the four-year period I was in, there were three court-martials. There was a deck, a summary, a general. There was 11 and a half months in the Navy prison up there on the top of Goat Island off a general court martial. There were 60, 70 days in solitary confinement. Well, there was 10, 12 captains mass. There were some other miscellaneous things, but they're not really important. The important thing is that I've crossed the line. I'm now over where I can't live with it and I can't live without it and I don't want to. My whole life now revolves around booze. I can't go into a place and sit down that serves alcoholic beverages. And after three or four, I want to get up and leave. So if I have three or four, I want to stay. And I'll go to any length to stay. Any length to be able to stay and to continue to drink. Many times I couldn't, many times I had to leave, but I didn't want to. And so the invisible line I've crossed. I'm discharged on Christmas Eve of 1945, and I came back to Los Angeles in 46. And God moves in strange and mysterious ways, don't he? And you know it, and I know it. And no matter what you do or you don't do, that's the way the deal is going to work out anyway. And 1946 is one of those years. I wish I really had the, the background, the education, the understanding, the vocabulary to explain it. I don't. I only know that the damnedest things happen in my life. That no matter how I try to move it around, that this is the way it works out. And in 1946, was a bad year. I got picked up five times. I got two 502s, which are drunk driving. I got two plain drunk, and then a 501 felony drunk driving hit and run bodily injury involved. And it all happened within a period of five or six months in the same city. You know, every alky has got a city called fix on him. Mine happens to be a rotten town over here called Pasadena. God, I hate it. I don't know why I went back to drink. I did time and time. It was like a maggot that'd bring me back in, you know. And I'd find myself in there drinking whatever I did. I got in trouble. I used to think they had an alarm system went around the city limits. And every time I crossed over, it went off. I said, get him. He's there. He'll pop I got me off. Well, the fourth pickup this year, I stand in front of the judge, a judge that I knew as well as my father. This judge and I, hell, we grew up together. I know him for so long. I knew him when he was shagging delinquents. That was me. I knew him when he was on a police court bench looking at Josh. That's me. He's a smart operator. He got up on a spear court bench. And I'm no meathead. You know, I'm with him again. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing I knew about this guy was he'd never lied to me. He'd say 60, 90, whatever it was. It always done it. Yeah. He looked out at me that day. He says, a year in a city jail, suspended, three years probation. You come back to this town. I hear about you in a place that serves yourself alcoholic beverages. You go to the can for a year. Or to jail. For a year. I get the hell out of my card room. And I walked out. And I'm a half smart alky like all alkies are. And I thought, boy, that guy, I ain't coming back to the city. No, no, I'm going to stay out. I'm not going to drink. I'm going to drink in these other places out there in the perimeter. And I did. For about two and a half months. Yeah, and it got so good. You know, I couldn't stand it. You know what prosperity does to an alcoholic? Sure. I'm 75 miles away one evening. <clears throat> and I'm drinking with a couple of guys. And I committed the cardinal sin. While I was drinking, I began to think. That's a bad deal. You should either drink or think. You should never get them both going at the same time. I got to thinking about that rotten judge in that lousy town, and that's a free country, and God knows I'm a veteran. Well, hell, the big rationalization. Well, what's left? I got in my car, drove 75 miles back to the city, went down to a joint, and drank up the booze, I closed the place, got out and got in my car. I went down one of the main drags in the wee hours of the morning, and the car pulled in front of me. I hit it and ran from the scene of the accident. But for the grace of God, it looks after damn fools and drunks. Why, poor folks didn't die on the city street that night. A <clears throat> matter of inches and seconds. That's what alcoholism is all about, isn't it? Seconds and inches. Yeah, that much. The snap of the finger. Thought I hit that car broadside at the rate of speed I was traveling, why all the poor folks would have died as it was I hit it in the back end. It spun it in the street, and some people were injured, but not as bad as it could have been, you see. <clears throat> I was picked up three blocks away. I was hauled down, put in a felony tank. I went down for the judge in the morning, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he said, get him the hell out of here. He is a disgrace to the city and to himself. But he said, son, drink is your problem. And if you don't knock off the booze, are you going to ruin your life? And I have heard this maybe a half a dozen times before that by ship's captains and my people and my friends, but I refuse to believe it because I know I'm a victim of unusual circumstances. It's not me, it's the rotten people. Once I get the people straight out, it'll be all right. And so I went out, and I went to the city jail to do the time. And in the city jail, as I mentioned, God moves his chains in a serious way. 150 or 200 guys doing time. Out of 150 or 200, one guy gets out of the bucket to go to AA meetings once a week. Out of all of it, guess who my cell partner is? That's right. This fanatic to go to these AA meetings once a week. That's who I share the cell with. He gets out of the can once a week on these meetings. 
he would come back and he would be dying to talk to somebody about it. Well, you had a large audience in a jail cell, you see. <laughs> so I would sit there and once a week I'd go through all this balderdash with him. And finally he got so ridiculous he wanted me to go to a meeting with him. And I told him, I said, Sullivan, I haven't got a drinking problem, i got a people problem out there, that's it. I'm too young to be an alcoholic. Well, your case is different, buddy. You're 36. The hell's the guy got when he's 36? You know, you're over the hill on the backside. <laughs> Might as well quit drinking, too. You and your brothers are a bunch of lousy drunks, so you ought to knock it off. You ought to quit. You ought to do what you got to do, but you ought to take leave me alone. And I went out there, and I went on my merry way. But he didn't know, and I didn't know. But the old shooter upstairs, he knows all about that. Do you look? He plants the seed. Eight and a half years later, I pick up a telephone. I'm looking for an outfit called A, and a guy named Sully. I found the program, but I never found Sully. I looked for him for a period of time. And after five or six years, I learned that he'd gone to Camarillo with a wet head, wet brain. But after three years of sobriety, this guy went back to drinking. <clears throat> Got so good he couldn't stand it. He thought he'd try one more time, and he couldn't quit. And they locked him up up there. He said he'd be up there forever. And so you kind of phase it out, don't you? You kind of give up on the guy, and you go about your merry way. And about two and a half years ago, maybe three at the outside, there was a meeting on the other side of town. And when the meeting was <clears throat> over, the guy came up, and he says, what's this guy's name you're talking about? His first name, and I told him, and he said, Christ, that's my brother. I said, the hell it is, where is he? And he says, Norm, you're going to find it's tough to believe that he's on the street now, and he has been for, for quite a while, and he's, he's going to make it, I think, but he, he needs some AA contact, and let's the three of us get together, and we'll get to a meeting. And I said, fine, let's do it right after the holidays, and he says, good. And after the holidays, this brother, this vector, dropped dead from a heart attack, and we didn't get together. And I still didn't know where my friend was, except he was there somewhere. And once again, why, well, you kind of push it in the backside, and last December... A year ago, I was in a meeting the other side of town again, and I looked down in the front row, and in the front row was sitting there with a guy named Sully that I shared a cell with some 27 years ago. And when the meeting was over with, I had the opportunity to sit there and say, Buddy, how's it going? And he says, God, it's going great. I got in nine weeks. He said, I just got out of the L.A. County Hospital, the general hospital, and it's going good, and, and we've got to get to a meeting. And I said, we will, and I'll call you, and I have, and, and we haven't been able to get together. But the proof for what comes out of something like this is you never give up. The reminder that one more time, you never give up on the guy that's still suffering, still hacking out there, because you never know. If it's only a prayer, Norm, that you're going to send up from time to time, do it, buddy. Hell, take a minute out of your busy life and send it up, will you, for the guy that's, that's still suffering out there, because you never know. God moves in strange and mysterious ways, and no matter what you do or you don't do, that's the way it's going to be. And who says that some Sunday morning you sit in a meeting and you look next to you, and who sits there but a guy maybe you shared a bar stool or a cell or whatever, and he sits there because maybe you took the time to send the prayer up for the guy that's still trying to cut it. Well, I didn't make the program then. Obviously, I went back out and drank and worked as hard as could have get here. I went to work for one of the biggest and the largest construction firms in the world at that time in the concrete pipe business. And I stayed with these people 11 years. And in the 11-year period of time, I was blessed to be in the right place at the right time. I got the right job. And the right job to me was a job that paid a lot of money. I had to have the money because I got a high overhead. If you got a high overhead, well, man, you got to have that money to meet that overhead. I'm a bar drinker, and a bar drinker packs a high overhead. You have said that, no question about it. Not only that, but about that time, I'd met a red-headed Irish woman, and we decided to get married. And that created a problem. That's a big overhead now. It didn't start out that way. My bar associates told me, oh, Norm, don't go off half cock on this marriage deal. Make sure this woman's got a decent job. Well, she had a good job in the beginning. Two months later, she walks into the house and she says, Norm, I've been to the doctor and I'm pregnant, but i got to quit my job. Well, God, the whole house comes down around me then, you know. Did you ever tell an alcoholic something you don't want to believe? I don't want to believe that, you know, no. But then you find out that this is fact, so you become big hearted. And I think to myself, well, hell, that caper takes about nine months. We'll give her two to get on her feet. We'll get the rotten job back, and everything's going to be just like it was. It's the story of the alcoholic's life, isn't it? Everything's going to be just like it was. Hell, that was 26 years ago. That woman ain't turned to tap since that day, you know. <laughs> God almighty, she got herself in that shape eight times. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so the locusts coming in every other year. Here she goes, St. Luke's again, you know. God, I'm sitting on that bar stool. I can't make a bar bill, and there she goes. And other problems with this woman. Her being redheaded and Irish, well, she had a violent temper and a rotten disposition. She used to yell at me a lot. And an alcoholic can't tell that people yell at him. He's a very sensitive person. <laughs> yes, you're out there drunk two or three days, and you come home. You're tired. Yeah, you've been busy out there. Right. Yeah. You're tired, and you're a little sick and a little junky as you walk out of the house, and you'd like a little love, affection, and understanding when you walk through the door. Oh, hell no, I walk through the door, and from 20 feet, she's gone, you're drunk again. Well, she smells your breath. 
And I'd always stand there dumbfounded. I wonder who the hell tells her all that stuff. You've got to get her on the defensive. Isn't that the way the thing goes? You've got to get that woman on the defensive. So, you start out by going, uh, do you know who you're talking to? Ah! Don't that get her right there, though? Been talking to the same slob now for over eight years, but you want to be reassured. <clears throat> so you introduce yourself to her. If there are two people here, that's a fringe benefit in AA. You won't have to introduce yourself to your wife anymore. Periodically, I used to stand there going, I'm Norm, baby, that's who the hell I am, and don't you forget it. And he'd go, I'm Norm, baby, don't forget it, you know. Mimic me, there's only the way them Irish can do it. Sometimes that happened when I had one of my dearest friends with me. He's my new bar associate, my new, my new business partner. I met him at the joint last night. I've invited him home. There he is, you know, the blind leading the blind. You're standing there, and he's going, tell her again, Norm, buddy, that's it, you know. You wish he'd die then. You've got to save face. So you give her one more chance. You say, apologize to me. I'm a best friend that I can't remember his name. And if you don't, I'm leaving. And this time's different than all the other 30 times I ever left here. How do you like that? Yes, she's hysterical now. She goes down the hall, throws all my clothes out. And you pick up the clothes, don't you? And you pack them out to the car. The clothes-packing alcoholic is a joy to his neighborhood. <laughs> When you get tired of watching your television, you can watch him. There he goes, you know, that arm on the clothes. Huh? <laughs> What's cuter than the old turkey deed alcoholic out there in these shorts? I carry that arm on the clothes, you know. And before he leaves, he wants to notify the neighborhood, so he honks on his horn. Honk, 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 you know, I'm leaving. There he goes down the street. Two days later, here he comes back again. Yeah. He comes home Sunday afternoon on a flat tire, you know, the old... Too drunk to change it, he drives on it. The rim drivers, they call them in AA. The old tire's flopping in there and the sparks are flying and he pulls that car down the street. He, he turns that baby into the driveway, pulls it up on the lawn, opens the door and he falls out. There he lays down there. Getting up off of the lawn, the first thing that you think about is, I wonder if anybody saw me. Yes! Because you think that nobody knows you drink, is that right? Sure. And then you, you rationalize the fact. Well, hell, if they saw me laying on the lawn, they probably thought I had the flu. Sure. Hell yeah, everybody lays on the lawn that's got the flu. You know that. We're the only people that know it. Well, then you go through the routine, don't you? You go in there and you stand there in front of that red-headed woman and you go, one more lie, one more promise, you're going to open the door. The tears are fine. <laughs> they got to take it again, baby. Jesus, give me a break. Got a hell of a deal for you. New priest, new parish, you know, another pledge. New doctor, new whatever. I'll do it all. Let me in. A schemer. And he schemes. And he gets in. And as soon as you get in, you start scheming to get back out again, don't you? Yeah. So you can get in that car and drive back down to that saloon. Get down there, as was mentioned before. On that bar stool. I'm a bar drinker, too. I like them joints. I like the dark lights. I like the rotten music. It hammers at you. Like the smell that kind of hangs in there, isn't it something? Who needs the desert? You just sit there and suck that baby up. Then it blows it all out, don't it? God! I like building castles at the Air Foreman Corporations. I like sitting there talking to the giants of industry, wondering what the poor slobs are doing tonight when all the big money's around you there. When you get tired of talking and lying to each other, and about maybe midnight or one o'clock in the morning, you're sitting there on that bar stool and you can look in the mirror. And you know why they put mirrors in bars? They put them there for alcoholics, so that he may sit there and stare at himself. Well, that, they call it the perpetual Maybelline look, that wide-eyed. You know, there he is. It's like you never saw yourself before. Oh, you good-looking devil, you. Yeah. As you're bringing that drink up, you get sight of your arm. You know, you look, God, <laughs> what a well-built killer you are, yeah. 150 pounds ringing wet, I couldn't flick my lips in them days, let alone anything else. <laughs> but that whiskey makes a killer out of you, don't it? A lover and a killer. Some nights you get so drunk you can't remember whether you're a lover or a killer. You get there, you don't know what face to make in the mirror. You wonder why all the dollies aren't down there at your end of the bar. You got a $30 smiling Frankie Gordon suit on. Sure. You got 50 cents worth of whiskey down the front of you. You got a little chili and mustard on your necktie. You smell bad, you can't talk. You're the mumbler. That's me for you. Nothing comes out, and I'm one step away from disaster. If I got to go to the men's room, it's all over. There he goes. Hell, yeah. 
That's the lover of the St. Gabriel Valley. There he is. Or you make some cute remark to the bartender, he's 86 he's yet. That's never enough. If you got my kind of personality, you go for 87. Yeah, 87 is another cute remark to the bartender. Now you're opening the door with your head going through to end up out there in the parking lot, the gravel parking lot, to end up with one of those famous diseases alcoholics have called pavement rash. Yeah. <laughs> it's a scab you get from here around here, you know. It's from rooting your head through gravel parking lots. Some alcoholics prefer pyrocantha bushes. They get it all done in one night. You know, that raking all over. Crawling out of bushes, hedges, or whatever, or parking lots to end up in the front seat of your car to go to bed. <clears throat> car sleepers. We've got lots of car sleepers in AA. You can always tell a new guy if he's done any recent car sleeping. He generally sits in his first meeting, you know, like that. It's just, yeah. <laughs> From having your head screwed out of the armrest all night, isn't it? And when that sun zooms through the windshield at 6 o'clock in the morning, that's called a spiritual awakening before I am. <laughs> you bring yourself to attention there in the front seat. Oh, God, your stomach hurts and your mouth stays terrible. Your teeth itch. You look down there on your dashboard. You threw up on that baby last night. You left your lights on, too. Or did you ever think the window was down? It was up. Oh, that rap, whack. God, that knocks the hell out of your head, too, you know. And yet I've sat there and I've said to myself, time and again, you're drinking fun. I'm having a good time. Yeah. I've got to get the hell out of L.A., though. they got that rotten whiskey in L.A. i got to get back down to Big Spring, Texas. God, did they love me in Big Spring. Yeah. That pearl beer and that bootleg whiskey or was it El Paso that they loved me. Or Dallas, or maybe it was Moses Lake, Washington, or Seattle, Albuquerque, or Phoenix, or Tucson, or on. And in reality, you know. You know they didn't. If you sat there and took an honest look at yourself, well, you know that every time you went out now, it seemed to be getting worse. It never got better. But you always felt that someday, somewhere, you're going to be able to control it, don't you? That somewhere you're going to be able to drink like your old man and your brothers and your people that work and to do business with it, you know, I'm sure. Around some corner, somewhere, someday, I'll control it. The obsession they talk about in Chapter 3 that every alcoholic goes through. And as I wandered through the lottery of my life, the whiskey took away every loving thing I had to many things in my life. Everything that I had was taken away to many things to me. I recall the day when I went home, and there on the front porch was the belongings, and there stands a red-headed woman. And there she said, Norm, you're a drunken bum. Norm, you never lived to be 35 years old. Hell, you're drinking yourself to death. Norm, me and the kids are neurotic because of you. We're scaring to death of you. How are you coming in, Norm? You're going to tear up the house again? You're going to stand there with that loaded 25 automatic waving it all around. Now, what are you going to do, Norm? I'm going to come in Sunday morning and see you laying on the floor, and the kids are all around there crying because you can't get up. No more, Norm. Well, you drug us down that gutter as deep as you're ever going to get us. You get the hell out of our life, Norm. Sit here, and I look down the street. I wait to see the car come home. It don't come. I hear a siren run, and I die again. I think the cops got you. I just time to find you laying dead in the middle of the street, Norm, you're never coming back, so we can't go any farther. I'll always love you, buddy, but you tore out all the feeling I ever had for you, one way or another. So please leave. And you walk out to your car and you drive away, don't you? And you say to yourself, as each and every alcoholic has said has gone through it, Christ God, why me, buddy? Why me? And I'm not that bad a guy. I want a friend Bill and the rest of them bombs out there. Why me? You and I, we know. If you drink enough booze long enough and hard enough, it's only going to be a matter of time, isn't it? The wheels of alcoholism grind very slow, but very fine. You give it enough time and it's going to take away everything you got. Just a matter of time. Sure, there's isolated cases of people put up with this crap for 30 years. Oh, he's hoping his jackass is going to straighten out. Thirty years they watch him flop in and out of the house. Thirty years they pick up the pieces. Thirty years they lie for him. Thirty years of promises they can never keep. Hell, I wouldn't put up with it thirty days, let alone thirty years. But God gives him a lot of strength, kind of a left-handed thing he hands down to him. Thank God he does, because huh? we have the opportunity to see one of the many miracles in Alcoholics Anonymous. The miracle of seeing a man and his woman coming through the door to that first meeting. And a guy, he don't look too good, and he's hung out. And a woman, you look at her, and she don't look too good either. And in her eyes, the story says, this jackass has tried everything in town, and nothing works, and this isn't going to work either. I'm sure of it, but we'll try. But now you see the same couple coming through the same door in just a couple of months of God. And a woman, and she's sharp down now. And a guy, he's sharp too, and his eyes are clear, and I seem to be laughing. And you look in a woman's eyes, and the story is complete, and it's changed, and it's it. I've been waiting 15 years for this to happen, and finally it's happened today. We're happy that we've ever been in our life. And this is made possible through a miracle. It's unique that we choose to call Alcoholics Anonymous. God love it. God bless it for the miracle.
For the new folks, though, we can't guarantee, can we, that this is the way it's going to be. No, no. We can only guarantee you here sobriety and a way of life, buddy. A way of life. And if you're a ditch digger, you're going to be a better ditch digger. We don't guarantee you're going to make a ton of scratch or drive a big iron or live in a big house on the hill. Or your woman's ever going to call you back. That may never come. The only guarantee we can give you is sobriety and a way of life. And whatever you're doing, you're going to be better at. And the day will come, I'm sure, if you'll buy the package that's available here, the sobriety and the way of life, the day will come when they will respect you. And the guy says to me one night, Respect me, that's not a hell of a lot, Norman. I said, buddy, it's a hell of a lot more than I had what I got here. Because nobody but nobody respected me. If you get no more than that, it's more than most alcoholics come in and look for. They regain the respect of the people. Losing families doesn't necessarily bring folks to AA. I think it has to be kind of a, an aggregate, a total of many things. I've got to believe that the clincher in my life was not the day that the boss called me in and says, the next time I catch you drinking on the job, you busted, you threw, you're out of here, and you'll never leave L.A. County for this company again. Never. I don't think that was it. Or the day that the woman left. I think that the day that I woke up to the fact that a man had walked into my life and he says, Norm, buddy, you've abused the privilege of owning it. we got to have it. And he took away my self-respect. The day I stood there and recognized I had no self-respect and I didn't need a mirror to know or to understand. That I stood there and I knew that I had absolutely nothing because nobody but nobody, myself included, respected me. A commodity that's the greatest thing a man owns, isn't it? We know men that spend hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars trying to buy self-respect. But the guy says, she can't have it. It's not a commodity. You don't go to the supermarket and check it out. No, no. Come on, this self-respect is earned. You can earn it, Norm. And what a break that we have Alcoholics Anonymous because we have the opportunity the second time around in our life to regain our self-respect. You couldn't buy it with all the money in the world, but as the man told me what I gave it to the program, he said, for $3.50 and a little bit of your time, Norm, we'll give you back your self-respect. A little bit of your time, and in that book, in the book is the 12 steps, and in the 12 steps is a way of life, and in the way of life is your self-respect. The day I realized that I no longer had this, <clears throat> the day that it's psychological second, maybe, that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, that I'm tired of hurting myself, that I don't want to go any farther, and I've got to believe, and I believe it today because the day is all I got, that that day occurred in February of 1954. But I got up off of the rotten floor and I was sick. And I walked in and I picked up the telephone and called the central office in Los Angeles. And I talked to a man and God loved this man. He was one of those givers. The reason he was such a grand man, he's learned early in his AA life, I'm going to keep what I can have, I've got to give it away. And he did. This guy's name was John. I'm sure John doesn't mind me breaking his enemy. John died some after I'd been sober about a year, a year and a half. And he was a marvelous individual. I had the opportunity many times to meet this man that I talked to that Sunday in the AA office. He not only gives it himself in that office, but you go down to the Alhambra group on the Thursday night, and you walk up the stairs at the top of the stairs. Who's standing there? A guy standing there named John, and he's looking for new people. As you walk through the door, he can spot him, and he slapped me on the back, and he took you in, and he poured you a cup of coffee, and he says, son, keep coming back. And above all, you know, don't get impatient, son. He said, remember something. It took you 15 years, one day at a time, to get yourself down there, down there. And it's going to take you maybe 15 years, one day at a time, to bring yourself back out. Don't be impatient. Give it some time. Get to a lot of meetings. Keep an open mind. Keep coming back. And that's the guy I talked to. That's the guy that says, here's some numbers you call. And the second guy, <clears throat> a number I call with a man with home and he come out to see me. My sponsor. He turns out to be my sponsor. Hard-hearted sponsor. Went to school, you know, for hard-hearted sponsors. This guy annoyed the hell out of me. He was a very old man. He was about 50, I think. <laughs> He had a very caustic attitude and an abrasive voice. And he sat there going any length to get it, and it just made me want to throw up. <laughs> he said that a half a dozen times if he said it once. If you want what we have, buddy, you got to go to any length to get it. He says you went to any length to get the booze, and he was the kind of sponsor, you know, they never give you a chance to answer a question, no. <clears throat> he said, you went to any length to get the booze, didn't you? Uh, yeah, you lied for it, cheated for it, conned for it, stole for it, anything. And so... You go to any to get the program. That's the way it is here. He says, me and my friends in my group, we don't pick guys up and take them to meetings. That's a softer, easier way. No, no. You get in your car tonight and you drive down to the meeting. If you haven't got a car, take the bus. If you haven't got a bus or bus money, walk. It's a hell of a walk, but you'll make it all right. He said, if I can make it, you can make it. And I thought, that's the only true thing that jackass said, you know. <laughs> yeah. What a rotten old man he is. And I was a little upset. I got in my car that night and I drove down to that Temple City Grove. 
Well, in the beginning, when I got the car getting ready to drive down, I was thinking, you know, I hope he is in that parking lot, and man, I'll crush him with my car. That's what I'm going to do. But you know, that soon leaves, because when you're going out to attend your first meeting, the things that run through your mind. You want, what is this AA? Am I going to see somebody there that knows me, and he's going to find out i got a drinking problem? You know? Sure, are they going to show me a way to handle the booze? I'll become a social drinker, drink like my old man again. Is that what they're going to show me? They're going to get the heat off. God, i got so much heat on. i got heat on all over town. Are they going to get the heat off and pay the bills? And I'm being foreclosed out of that house. They're going to help that. Well, what are they going to do? The curiosity of this program in the beginning, and it drives you in, don't it? And you come on down with the curiosity of wondering what it is. And so as I turned into that Temple City meeting, my sponsor was standing in this parking lot, and he too came up and slapped me on the back and took me on in to my first meeting. The Temple City group in those days, it used to be down in Rosemead. I just kind of throw that out. If you're looking for it, it meets in Arcadia today. <laughs> doesn't mean too much. In any event, the cliche of this group, we used to have a liquor store on the corner, and then the group, and then the cemetery. And the cliche, <laughs> the cliche of the group was, if you get by here and stop here, you won't make it over there, you know, yes. <laughs> and then all the donkeys would laugh, and what the hell's so funny about that when you're new? He's trying to tell you if you keep drinking, you're going to die out there. And I didn't think it was very funny. He took me on in. This was one of them wealthy groups you hear about in AA. We had maybe 100, 125 in a group in them days, and they had so much money that they had donuts before and after the meeting. Can you imagine anything like that? A hell of a deal. And they'd always buy three or four jelly donuts, and they'd save them for new guys coming in, you know. You're subjected to the sense of humor of the alcoholic immediately. They spot a new guy coming through the door, they go up to you and go, Oh, how are you? We're glad to have you have a cup of coffee and here's a, here's a jelly donut. You know, I don't want the donut. Now, you're looking down something you left on the street last night, you know. And then they all sat around going, Did you see him? Oh, yeah, I thought he was choking there. And an alcoholic ever gets over, gets a warm sense of humor about this thing. And the only good part of it was, if you stayed around there for a month, they'd let you do it to the next new guy that came in, you see. And you're subjected to all of this fall to right in the beginning. We used to stand around before the meeting, everybody was drinking coffee and eating these rotten donuts and talking at the same time. Everybody's talking about something different. You ever notice that? Yeah, and you're standing here and you're brand new, this is your first night, you know, you're listening to this one guy, and you're waiting to get to the punchline of the story, before he ever gets to the punchline of the story, you know, the guy interrupts him, you know, there he stands. You spend years and they wouldn't hear the end of a story. In the beginning, you hear that phrase, keep coming back. And you think, that's why. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know and I know that isn't a fact, but it's, it's dumbfounding, isn't it? You're standing there, all of this is going on. And you're sick, you know, and they're yelling and smoking four cigarettes at a time, it seems like. <laughs> then the meeting begins, and then everybody lights up more cigarettes, you know. Your eyes are burning, your throat gets raw, you're sicker than a horse, you're hot over. And then a man stands in front of the group and he tells everybody what a jackass he is and they become hysterical over it. <laughs> this guy that was talking that night, he'd been in 80, 90 jails, got a lost track of him after a while. And he thinks, God almighty, I didn't think they'd built that many jails. But the more jails he goes to, the more they laugh. The more he gets worked over and beat up, the more they laugh. The bigger the bomb, the greater the love, the finer the laughter. Alcoholics Anonymous, they call this thing, you know. The guy talks about drinking Jamaican ginger, give him the Jake leg, cripple him up so bad to put him in a hospital for two and a half months, and they were out of their chairs with a stereo. <laughs> yeah. The funniest thing they'd ever heard was that that man couldn't walk. <laughs> and you're sitting there in the day, meeting, you're 29 years old, and you're thinking, man, I've been around a little. Jeez, but I've been far. <laughs> well, I've only been in 25 jails and drank a little Vitalis. I won't make it here. <laughs> But thank God for the people of the program because they got the pattern and they explained it and all of the talkers I heard in the early years explained it by saying, it doesn't make any difference what you drank or where you drank it or the matcha consumed, it's what it's doing to you. And if it's tearing up any part of your life, buddy, you don't have to go any farther you've been. And I sat there and I could say, yes, man, you're right. I don't have to go any farther than I've been. You said that I didn't and I don't want to. My life has torn the hell out of my life and I don't want any more and you said I didn't have to have it. And I believe that speaker. I had to. I look at this guy, you know, this guy is nine and a half years, he's sharp and his eyes are clear. He's got a set of threads on, must run him a hundred and a half. I'm thinking if he didn't get nothing else in his AA outfit, didn't he get a set of drapes out of it, though? Oh, boy, that's all right. I'll stick around a little, get me some, too. 
which proves the point, don't it, that 80% of the people never remember 80% of what you have to say, but they never forget how you look. By example is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, which takes you back to that cliche that I heard years ago. What he is speaks so loud, I cannot hear a word he says. By God, by example. And he was the example, and if I wanted what he had, I'd come back here to find it. And I wanted a little of it. He talked about coming to this AA group in this program and buying a package. And how one day a miracle come to pass. His woman had divorced him and remarried. His kids had hated him. And this day they came down to see him. One by one they come to see him. And they learned to like him. And then to love him. And then respect him. And had I had the foresight to look around that night, you know what I'd have seen? I'd have seen three or four tough AA guys sitting there in that group. And the tears are running down their eyes and they're all choked up. And they're crying. Not for themselves, but for him. Because they were happy. And the story of AA was told that night, as I understand the story of AA. And maybe it's oversimplification, but it's my understanding is that they laughed because they were miserable and they cried because they were happy and they called it Alcoholics Anonymous. Sure. How do you clear away the wreckage of your rotten, lousy past? How do you move that crap out? Don't you learn, and it's not the beginning to learn to laugh a little bit, to be able to laugh, to bring it up, to start, because when you get hit, there's nothing to laugh about. But then the day, in spite of yourself, you people that are new, in spite of yourself, the day's going to come when you're going to start to laugh a little. Yeah, you're going to sit there at that meeting, you're going to go, oh, oh God, don't let him look. No, yeah. But it's going to start to come out, isn't it? And before you know it, well, you're going to start to buy a little that's available here. You're going to go out and make the amends and buy the package. The total package of the program, and the package is when you make the transition, when you quit taking and you start to give. You give a little for the hell of it. The no compromise kind of giving you and I understand here in A. Not the kind you can twist and turn and use for your own benefit. Just the giving for the pure hell of it. And this isn't something that's normal for the likes of me or you either. No, no. Alcoholics are takers. I laid out of that city street and I stole every loving thing I was. I took it all. I thought I had the key to happiness. Christ, I never had the key chain. I never knew what happiness was until I, I quit taking it and I start to give a little. I give a little for the hell of doing it. And we have, you see, available to us the opportunity to give. Pick up the ashtray, make the coffee. <clears throat> Secretary of a group, central service, general service, institutional work, 12-step call, a greater, greater way to, to give yourself for the hell of it. And if you do, my friends who are new, the reward is insurmountable. Not something in a material sense. No, no, but something in a sense of well-being. That's what I looked for, was a sense of well-being. I drank whiskey to feel good. I'd get up on that plateau and I'd have that sense of well-being, I'd feel good. And it was temporary, though, wasn't it? And it was gone. And I woke up in the morning. And a friend of mine had come to see me one more time. His name was Remorse. And he reached in and he tore my guts out. And the only thing that put remorse out of my life was whiskey. And I traded in the whiskey that I found out there for the honesty and the giving of Alcoholics Anonymous. And in turn, I was rewarded with a sense of well-being that I've been able to experience from time to time. As I walk down the city street and a wave comes all over, and I feel so fine, and I can't understand why. And in the bitter end, I know and you know, it's not going to be what you accumulate that's going to make the difference when they're hanging you out to dry. It isn't going to be the material of the car you parked in the garage that's going to make the difference, is it? No, no. It's going to be what you give away that makes a difference. What you give away and you want nothing back. And we of the program have the opportunity to give a little from time to time, just for the hell of doing it. But I like to try to tell every guy here that's a new man or a new woman that after you approach this program that every day is a holiday and every meal is a banquet. But that isn't the way it is. What we're going to give you here is equipment to stand out there and be counted like everybody else. That's what we have to offer. Stand out there in that jungle and be counted like everybody else. That's what we have. But if you're big enough, Norm, to take the good days, you've got to be big enough to take the rotten and the lousy. You and I don't look forward to it, do we? No, no. I don't want to see any more of them lousy days. But they are. They're going to come. I've seen some, and I'm going to see some more, and so are you. But I don't want any more. No, no. I don't want any more in 1962. I don't want to walk out of St. Louis Hospital again going, Jesus Christ, God, old buddy, old friend up there. What the hell are you doing to me? But you know, I've been sober eight years, God. You know, I used to think you'd have a bad for every year or something. You know, give me a break. I've been around a long time, buddy. This grief, this heartbreak, this misery, you asked me to pack is too much, old friend. I can't make it. Yet deep inside, you know, don't you? Deep inside, you know the old shooter up there. He's all right. He never gives you more than what you can pack. He gives the big loads to the big horses. And the small ones to guys named Norm. Instead of standing there, buddy, crying a poor mouth about what you didn't get or what he asked you to carry, why don't you thank him for what you have? And if you feel real bad about something, take a moment out of your busy life and look down the street. And what do you see down the street? Well, hell, I see a guy. There he goes. And he carries a load ten times the size of mine. And the only difference between he and I is that he carries it with great dignity. He doesn't find it necessary to cry the poor mouth about what he didn't get. 
He stood just for a moment and he says, thank you, my friend, for what I have. And when it come again, God, give me the strength to stand and to thank you for what I got. If for nothing else, let me thank you, my friend, for the 19 years and four months you let me run down and walk down the sunny side of the street. Let me thank you for the sun that I've seen on that street. Let me thank you and know that above all, that men will die and never see 19 days, 19 weeks, or 19 months. That they'll walk down the street of booze and fantasy and busted dreams and broken hearts and tears by the back of ball, and they'll die on that rotten street out there. That some will cross over and come over to see us and be here for a while, and they won't buy it, and they'll go back again, and they too will die, maybe. And unfortunately, each and every year brings one to pass. And last holiday season, a, a call from a friend of mine, and he says, a buddy died. He died in a rotten joint down in South Elmine, in a rotten motel. And the booze was all over. And they picked him up. And they took him out. And they had a funeral. And five came, for all intents and purposes. Three gals from al came. Another Alki and myself. And the other A guy was drunk. And I looked around and I thought, God, what a waste. What a pure waste this is. God, give me the strength, will you? The next time that I think it's tough, the next time that I can't tolerate it, the next time the load is big as you ask me to pack, give me the strength to thank you, my friend, for what I've seen, for what I have. Give me the strength to thank you for the 19 years and four months that I've walked down the sun and the sunny side of that street. For the 19 years I woke up and made the decision of which way I want to live. But nobody makes that decision for me. I make it. Let me thank you, my friend, for not having to compromise my life nor justify my existence. Let me thank you for the journey I've had and the self-respect that I've expended and felt from people and myself. Let me thank you for the days that I've worked and got in the car and driven home to see a red-headed woman who's my woman. And I live there in that house with her. For I came home one day and she said, you're acceptable. And I walk through that door time and time again now to see a red-headed woman. <clears throat> and I'm respected by her because I'm her old man. I'm respected by the few of them bandits that are still left living in my joint because I'm their father. <laughs> but nobody cried at the old... But nobody cried at my house today because their old man was drunk and tore it up. I haven't heard a kid of mine scream at me for years not to hit their mother. I've watched them go from small ones into big ones and I've sent them to school. And I've got a couple of them who've got education and nobody in my family ever cut it that far. But I've got daughters that I've taken downtown and I've bought them high-heeled shoes and prom dresses. I've walked in stores with them and they were chickens and they put on shoes and dresses and they became women. And they looked at me and I looked at them and we respected each other. I for them for what they had become and me because I was their old man and for what I was that moment at that time. And a daughter across town that I can call up from time to time and we have chats and talk about it all. And when the phone and the conversation is over, she says, you know something, Dad? And I say, well, Jesus, I love you. And it's like somebody reaches through the phone and just kind of gives you a heart a pinch. And then one day, some three and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to send out invitations to, to a wedding to have people come. And some 400, they came. But I can remember the day I could send out 400 invitations for people to come to see me shot and nobody comes, do they? No. But that day they came, and they sat at the church, and they played the music. And another little chicken, she walked out the door, and she's got a white dress on. And she come up, and she grabbed her old man's arm, and that was me. And I looked at her, and I cried, and she looked, and we cried to both of us as we stood there. And I took her down the aisle, and give her to a jackass, you know. She married a jackass. <laughs> But before that, and he ain't a bad jackass today, incidentally. <laughs> before that old jackass ever got there, there was only me and there was only her. And the, the results of it was all that I could look out in that sea of people and I could be part of it because I could remember the day I could stand in a room full of people and I stood by myself. Lonely, you know, and I know, lonely Christ is the alcoholic. The day you stand there and you tell the world you don't need a friend, and you tell them all, but inside you say to yourself, Jesus, I wish I had a friend. And that day I had the opportunity to look out, and I saw, and what I saw was 60, 70 guys from AA, and they were my friends, and they looked sharp, and their eyes were clouded and clear, and some had tears, and they looked at me. And I knew what was running through their mind, and they was trying to say, Norm, buddy, Jesus, you, you sure look sharp coming down that aisle. Too bad, Norm, the people in this church, the balance of them, don't know who you are and where you came from and what you have and what it took to bring you here. And there's moments like that I want to scream to the world and say, Charlie, Jesus, isn't it a shame? Isn't it too bad that I can't tell them all where we came from and what we have? Too bad we can't introduce them to all our hundreds and thousands of friends because without these friends and without this program, 
but for the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous and these friends, I could have missed it all. God bless you. Thanks a million.